Hope your lives are being blessed. If your lives are not being blessed, may I suggest that uh, you need to dive deeper into prayer, deeper into God's Word, and really making a deeper effort, a more conscious effort to uh, uh, abide in Christ. That's going to be the essence of our message today. I really don't think we can hear enough messages on this type of a theme. We really need to hear it. We really need to get a, uh, have, to have a firm conviction within our heart and soul about this blessed truth that we're going to be getting in today. And this will be part 10, Mystery of the Covenant. I want you to think about this. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve had many blessings, did they not? If you really stop and you think about it, they had many opportunities. In fact, they had access to all the things of the garden but one tree. And that is, or was, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. All the abundance, but one restriction. i got to say that again. All the blessings, all the abundance, but just one restriction. One way of sin among all the abundant blessings that were placed before them or given them. All they had to do was say no to that one tree, that forbidden tree, Isn't that right? All they had to do was say no to that one tree. Unbelievable in many ways when you stop and you think about it. How hard could that be? Well, apparently harder than it would appear. But let's contrast the uh, guard situation with man's dilemma today. Or man's dilemma after the fall of Adam and Eve and their sin. Today, things are different. And I have to pause there, and I want you to think about that before I move ahead. Things are different. You may say, no, things aren't different. And I would say to you, you're wrong. Things are way different for us today than for Adam and Eve. In this age or era after the fall, there are now many ways of destruction. Many trees, we could say, of forbidden fruit that have been growing up, that are there to lure us away. Many wrong choices, but only one correct way, only one real way of truth do we have today as a Christian people? One, we could say, narrow path of life, but many paths of destruction. Isn't really that what the Scriptures teach us today? Isn't that the truth? Just the opposite, then, what we are experiencing today than what was there in the Garden of Eden. How could Adam and Eve, with all their blessings, all the blessings that God had given them and provided for them, all they had to do was avoid one tree. But they couldn't resist that one tree, that one temptation. How could the carnal mind do that? Because the carnal mind is enmity with God, the Scriptures tell us. It will search out that way which seemeth right unto man. God actually created or designed man to fall by giving us a carnal mind. It wasn't by accident. You've heard the statement before, and it is very true. God set Adam and Eve up. He really did. And again, he didn't have to give them a carnal mind. He could have made them a mind that could resist that, that wouldn't give in to that temptation, a mind that was not at enmity with him. But he gave us 
He gave Adam and Eve, he gave us that type of a mind, did he not? And with the carnal mind, it will find a way of rebellion. But the good news is that the Holy Spirit will drive that carnal defect right out of our heart and give us a new heart to serve him. And that's the blessed truth of the new covenant that I think in many ways still we have not comprehended. Man has not, certainly many Christians have not comprehended the blessedness and that gift of life in many ways that we have been given by and through the new covenant. But it sure does amaze me when I look at that scene, that situation that took place in the Garden of Eden. They had all, God said, of all the trees, of all the fruit, all the abundance of the garden, you can have it. You can partake of it. I only have one restriction, one caveat, one no-no, and that is do not partake of that tree, the forbidden tree of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's it. Do you think you can resist that one tree? I'm giving you all this other stuff. Do you think you can resist that one tree? And they could not, or they did not. Amazing. And again, what situation do we find ourselves in today? We have all the abundance of wrong choices. We have a bunch of of opportunities of rebellion. And God says, this is the situation I've, dri- I've moved you into. I've moved Adamic man. I've moved this creation into. You have all these opportunities for sin. And I'm placing before you one clear, decisive, right choice. What choice would that be? Who is Jesus? He's the tree of life. Not the forbidden fruit, not that forbidden tree. He's the tree of life, not the tree of death. And if you want to have life and life more abundantly and all that goes with it, you have to choose or enter into life through Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. That's the blessed truth that will set us free. And you know something? What we don't understand, Christians fail to understand, is that when we enter into life, we all of a sudden have more choices. Oh no, our lives will be restricted. We'll be cut off. No. Actually, the truth is, when you're in Christ, and you're abiding in Christ, and all that that encounters, and all that entails... You're actually much freer. You will have many more blessings. If we had that type of kingdom, the kingdom of God living, we would be a freer society. We would be a more advanced society. We would not have all the sickness, all the crime, all the dead, all the war, all the trouble that we are experiencing today under man's carnal humanistic regime. We could call it all kinds of names. Man's corrupt oligarchy, man's democracy, man's republic, man's monarchy, whatever you want to call it, communism, socialism, whateverism. There are many ways of destruction. But up here, we got to get firm in our mind there's only one right way. Oh no, there's this appeal coming from over here, an appeal coming from over here, and an appeal coming from over here, and an appeal coming from over here. Oh, what do we do? You say no. It's that simple. No. What are you, the tree of life? No, you're not the tree of life. Oh, you sound so appealing. You look so wonderful. No. Oh, we have all these benefits, all these promises, all this socialism. No. 
You have a, you have a, a health care program over here that sounds so wonderful. Oh, it won't cost me anything? Liar. No. I don't care if you say it's not going to cost me anything. I know you're a liar. You're a liar. You're a liar. You're a liar. There's only one right way, and that's through Jesus Christ. That's through the tree of life. Um, I was sent this article by a uh, a lady on our uh, on my email list, and uh, she actually got it from her uh, grandson. And it is called Government Sponsored Mind Control in America Teen Screen Scam. And uh, that got my attention real quick. October 6, 2012. This is when this was written. Has some of you seen it? Yeah. Okay, I'm just going to read portions of it to you. But you need to hear this, and you need to think about what's going on here. Quote, There is an ongoing battle with the uh, psychological health and welfare of America's children and eventual all Americans. Under the new Freedoms Commission, NFC, as it is the eventual intent to screen and treat with mind-numbing drugs all Americans for mental illness by using criteria designed to elicit false positives. I love the way that they use that word there because it's false positives. Oh, it's a positive. It sounds so positive, but it's a false positive. The relative the relatively new mind control programs have commenced with the intent of compelling the mental health testing of all 52 million school children and the 6.2 million adults who walk through doors of every school in America on any given weekday. Acting under the exams are to be administered in kindergarten, fourth, and ninth grade. The screening program requires no mental notification and carries the force of law. And this program continues unabated to this day, as is the case with vaccinations, the diagnosis and treatment under the mind control policies of the Bush and Obama administrations will eventually be universal. They start out gradual, gradualism, and work their way up, taking more and more controls, more and more liberties with our freedoms and liberties. Moving ahead in another section. Now, surprisingly, Eli Lilly gave, this is the lady, who gave $1.6 million in campaign contributions during the 2000 election. 82%. George, you had your hand? Eli Lilly is a pharmaceutical company. Yes. It, okay. Eli uh, Lilly is a pharmaceutical company. 82% of the money went to the Republicans and George W. Bush. The pharmaceutical and health products industry has spent more than 80, 800 million in federal lobbying and campaign donations at the federal and state levels in the past seven years. Why do you think they're doing that? Spending that much money? Because there's a lot of money to be made in this. No other industry, it goes on to say, has spent more money to sway public policy during this same period Public health and welfare be damned, and now in order to increase their market share, the pharmaceuticals are coming after your children. In 2002, Teen Screen, how do you like the way that sounds? Teen Screen, it's teens screening each other. Teen screening people with incentives. In 2002, Teen Screen contracted with the public relations firm of Rabin, Rabin, Rabin Strategic Partners. Rabin, R-A-B-I-N. Sounds familiar almost, sounds 
like, yeah, it sounds, well, sounds like, sounds Jewish, right? Oh, it couldn't be. Nah. Uh, to provide each teen in the United States with easy access to this free mental health screening program. Rabin's marketing efforts have proven to be a huge success. Rabin provided Teen Screen with a 10-year marketing strategy. The marketing plan called for an intense public relations plan, including lobbying and advertising, in order to expand and implement the plan. Teen Screen's use of Rabin's marketing strategy is paying great returns. For example, in 2004, Progress report stated mental health screening programs are now established in 48 states. And by the way, some of this material may sound dated to you, but they withhold a lot of this data and it's stored and it's not released what they gathered until years after the fact. Further, the report stated that a total of 19 national groups have approved this, have approved the screening of our youth mental health. They're so concerned about our youth's mental health. Disturbingly, Rabin's claims a waiting list of 250 additional Kool-Aid drinking communities which have expanded interest in the screening programs. Oh, uh, I was going to read part of this too. Big Pharma... Big Pharma's or Pharmakia NDA permeates the development of the NFC as they cleverly uh, cook the books to establish le their legitimacy. Through the creation of pharma-friendly NFC policy supporting experts, they have succeeded in greatly expanding the scope of the disease while simultaneously narrowing, narrowing the treatments and perimeters to a few set of very expensive drugs which produce very dangerous side effects. Finally, the NFC is supporting shoddy screening and diagnosis and an effort to identify an endless reservoir of potential pharma, pharmaceutical customers. For example, one of the qu questions which appears in the teen screen is, quote, Have you often felt nervous or uncomfortable when you have been with a group of children or young people? Say, like in the lunchroom or school or a party, end of quote. Well, obviously, who hasn't felt, felt that away from time to time? Of course. And with a lot of these nutcases that are out there, and uh, sodomites that are, and others that are openly encouraged to l l live this lifestyle and be this type of way, I feel very uncomfortable with them. I can guarantee you, can you imagine for most of us, they'd be targeting us right away. Okay, yeah. All right, lastly, let's see, it says here, it is not just our children that are under attack for mind control police. Veterans are being victimized all around the country by the Obama administration who have expanded this medieval approach to mental health care by recently signing an executive order which expands suicide prevention treatments in, to returning veterans. By the way, stress here, executive order. Didn't need Congress. Oh, you know, don't, you know, Congress will limit their powers. Well, Congress has not limited their powers, really. But not only that, he doesn't need them. He has tons of power through executive orders. Yes, and czars, yeah. Okay. Um, the new program has worked so well for, form, for a former, that a former veteran, Brand, Brandon Rayub, R-A-U-B, was locked up in a mental health institution against his will and was not suicidal. He was locked up for an anti-government rant on his Facebook page regarding the, the fact that 911 was an inside job. Gee, could any of us be locked up for thinking that? 
when one considers the treatment of Rahab and other veterans at the hands of the new mind control police, this begs the traditional question, with friends like these, who needs enemies? John Whitehead, many of you have heard of him, a leading attorney for the Rutherford Institute, has stated that many veterans are disappearing for expressing similar views. How many of you were aware of that? Many veterans are just simply disappearing for expressing these, quote, anti-government or politically incorrect views. Does this remind anyone else of the old Soviet Union when they deemed political dis- dissents as, quote, political schizophrenia, end of quote? When the Soviets had the first version of the National Defense Authorization Act and just disappeared people who disagreed with the government, this may be hard for some to accept. But when one uh, when one comes uh, realize that the government has been hijacked by bankers who are using traditional Soviet style tactics to eradicate the last vestiges of American civil liberties, the game plan becomes really apparent, end of quote. Well, you know, I don't know how most Judeo-Christians would react to what I just read there. I would like to think some of them are beginning to wake up. But with messages that are taught today to blend in, to accept, to go along, to be more loving. You know, you think about all the commercials that are going on today. Think about the commercials for homosexuals. Think about all the commercials, I will even say, though, People get mad at me over this because, you know, it's just not loving and somebody might get offensive. Believe it or not, people are attacking me over this and writing me and uh, uh, angry with me and take me off your mailing list because you're speaking out against uh, interracial marriage. Well, I'm sorry. I'm still going to do it. I'm sorry. I still believe it is a danger to our society. I'm sorry, but I still believe it is not only wrong for our people, but it's wrong for their people as well, and it's a detriment to their race as well. It's not favorable. It's not good for any of us. It's not good for our society. It's not really helping us get along. As a matter of fact, with all the um, acceptance that's going on in our world today, are we getting along, along more and loving one another and becoming more accepting of one another more? No. But someone's spending an awful lot of money on commercials and movies and stuff to show this over and over and over again. I don't know if any of you watch TV, but even if you don't, just walking by and you're eating in a restaurant and you see the uh, TV on, you're going to see commercials of a black and white. I mean, just uh, the other day I saw this commercial on a uh, furniture and uh, a black a black man comes and, and lays on the bed, and his white wife comes down and sits right next to him, or a white girlfriend or whatever. I'm like, hmm, how many Americans watch that, and they just get used to it and used to it, or see it over and over? And just, oh, it's a, oh, pastor, everybody's doing it. You're just hateful in saying that. Well, you know, again, something, friends, if I'm just, uh, boy, I sound like um, uh, Biden there, friends. <laughs> I'm kind of strange. Well... You are my friends, and most Christians are listening to this, I think, and you are my friends, even though we may disagree politically politically or religiously on some issues. I like to think you are my friends still. We don't have to all agree on everything, but you ought to have be uh, listen and be able to discern what's truth or not. And here's the thing. If I'm making this up and it just comes off the top of my head because I am, I quote, racist, I'm just a hate monger, and that's the only reason I'm saying that, well then, yeah, I don't have any real basis for it. And I really should shut up because I don't have any biblical basis for it. 
But if I can find example after example after example where the Word of God tells Israel not to mix themselves, not to be unequally yoked together, etc., etc., I think I have strong biblical foundation, and I'm sorry, I'm not going to be quiet about it. And I don't want any minister out there of God, and I wouldn't want to listen to any minister of God be silent on the truth from God's Word because it's politically incorrupt and somebody has to get off our mailing list. Or because some sweet little grandmother out there has a homosexual child that goes to school or is, or daughter or whatever, you know, and, uh, take me off your list because I love my, I love my grandchildren. I wouldn't want to be offensive to them. And what you're saying is offensive. What? You know, well, like I like to tell them, uh, what if your, uh, uh, grandson grew up to be a pedophile? Oh, I, I, I don't want, you don't want to be offensive? Uh, what if your what if your uh, grandchild grew up to be a number of things a rapist a murderer we could go on down the line you don't want to put any restrictions on them oh but as a parent yo sure you believe when you're raising your children to spank them to discipline them to teach them right from wrong why where did that stop when they grow up may I ask you I mean, am I, the, am I from Mars or am I on another planet? Or do you all see what I'm saying here? What's wrong with our world today? Which brings me to the next thing I want to share with you. And uh, it is from a um, professor. And... Uh, his name is Alan Bloom, and I want you to really uh, think about this. Alan Bloom is a um, professor at the University of Chicago, uh, described the prevalent thinking among American university students when he wrote this in his book, The Closing of the American Mind, here's what he said, quote, There is one thing a professor can, abso- can be absolutely certain of. Almost every student entering the university believes, or says he believes, that truth is relative. Relativism is necessary to open-mindedness. And this is the virtue, the only virtue, which all primary education for more than 50 years has dedicated itself to inculcating. Openness and the relativism that makes it the only plausible stance in the face of various claims to truth and various ways of life and kinds of human beings is the great, is the great insight of our times. The true believer is the real danger. Are you listening? The true believer is the real danger. That's you and I, folks. The point is not to correct the mistakes and really be right. Rather, it is not to think you're right at all. See? See? You're bad if you think you're right. You're bad if you're a Christian and claim to have biblical absolutes. I read that over and I had to read it over again and again to get it in my mind. What And, and, and the profound truth that he's bringing out there. I've known this. And whether a Christian has known this or not, surely... If you just partially read and consider God's Word, you have to suspect that what this uh, professor is saying is exactly the problem and what is going on. The message is, relativism is necessary. Why might relativism be necessary? Because such a belief is necessary to destroy one's belief in moral absolutes. Most university professors are blatantly and openly engaged in mind control. 
This certainly includes the media, movies, commercials, politics, and dare I say even religion in many cases. They couldn't do it if the majority of the ministers were not complacent or go along with this. Destroying an individual's values is the main function of mind control today, especially in the classrooms. It's, it's becoming more and more of a problem in kindergarten, in our elementary, junior high, and high schools, but most certainly you see it in an advanced form of that in the universities and colleges of America. But it is also to turn Christians away from the Word of God. How many times again have we heard about this, and I've talked about it, I'm going to continue to talk about it, because it's an absolute truth, we see it over and over again. I saw it when I was in the university. Christians, young people, good young people, leave their homes, their churches, they go to the universities, and they leave hating parents, being rebellious, being agnostic and atheistic. You know, this stuff is quite easily corrected with the truth. I want you to understand that, first of all. I'm not going to get deep into that right now, but truth is very, very powerful. And the reason I do say that now is because they fear the truth. Why do they fear the truth? Exactly. Why do they fear it? Because the truth will set our the minds of the people free. It will do that. All they have to do is hear it, be given the truth in the proper way, and their humanistic, socialistic, dung thinking will it'll be gone. Because it won't be able to stand up to the real biblical litmus test. The Word of God. The Word of God is sharper, more powerful. It will destroy the deception. But they have to hear the truth. They can't come to church and just hear a bunch of humanistic reasoning in the name of the Bible or in the name of religion and expect that to work. They have to understand that there are biblical absolutes. They have to understand there is right and wrong. There is good and evil. And that, they're, they're, that we have to stand against evil. We have to prepare against the wrong and the evil that is going on in our society today. And the way that we do that is through by having and inculcating within the minds and the hearts of our young people biblical absolutes, the, the word of God, the law of God. The law of God is a light. What they are, what is placed within the minds and the hearts of our young people today is darkness. Darkness. The darkness is quite, it can look ominous. It can look powerful when it's dark. You turn out, if I turn out the lights in here right now, made it totally dark. Oh my God, the darkness is powerful. It's covering all of us. It's surrounding all of us. But all of a sudden, I just flip on the light and boom, it's gone just like that. Light is way more powerful. And the problem with darkness is it's the absence of light. Christians have been absent from the scene. They've given over They've, they've abdicated their duties and responsibilities. They've been, they haven't been serving God Almighty and His kingdom the way that we've been called to do. That's why the uh, forces of darkness have so much power today. But if just a handful of Christians would start taking it back and applying biblical reasoning, using, relying, and standing firm on the Word of God, I don't care what these heathens say. I don't care what this pagan thinking tells us. Rely on the Word of God. Stand on the Word. Come, excuse me, hell or high water. Period. And the only reason you might adjust is if you have come to a deeper understanding of some purpose or value biblically that you didn't quite understand before. It's perfectly okay. Yes. 
We are to be thinkers. We are to be researchers. We are to be innovators. And we do have actually more freedom and liberty through Christ. Again, I don't think people believe that. I wish I could show people, don't you? Kingdom of God living. I, they would be amazed at the educational advancement. They would be amazed because we wouldn't have the corruption. Just think about the corruption we read about in the mind control of our young people that I just read to you in that article. It's because of the payoffs and the lobbying and the corruption in government that these pharmaceutical industries were able to rise up and have a monopoly in this area. Well, it's just that one area, Pastor. Oh, are you really serious? They have control over the medical industry. There are, med- there are advancement in health that are available to us today, just like in the energy industry, that would blow you away. There is no doubt in my mind whatsoever there's free energy. But that was bought up. That was controlled. That was corrupted long ago by the oil industries and our government. Well, I don't know. You know, the Republican, you know, Mitt Romney says he'll free up the oil. And I'm all for them oil industry guys. And Obama, you know, he's over here for the... uh, for for uh, the wind energy and stuff, and he's a bad guy. You see, they got you in this dialectic thinking. They're both idiots. They're both communists. They're both destroying our nation. Can I get an amen? Amen. They're both lying to us. But under real free biblical thinking, advancements are there. Cures for cancer are there. Cures for diabetes are really there. What if I told you there was a cure for diabetes today that, uh, and I know you may laugh at this, but I'm, I'm serious. Uh, I'm not, you're not laughing at the cure, but I'm talking about that's illegal. That part. What if I told you there's a cure? I'm not saying there is. Not saying there is necessarily. Keep you on the edge here. I'm not saying there isn't. I'm not saying there isn't. I do have to be a little bit careful what I do say from time to time on the pulpit here, believe it or not, for a lot of different reasons. But nonetheless, uh, I don't want to go into that right now. I don't, I don't want to take away from the message, but there's some more I need to say on that, but I'm not going to get into that right now. I don't want to detract from the fact that What if there is a cure and it's, quote, illegal? Years ago, uh, our uh, friend Ken Anderson in Phoenix, back in the early 80s, was brought, was um, uh, set up by the medical and the FDA and the AMA for treating cancer patients that had tumors with an ingredient called Tumorex. And what he did was they came to his clinic, and he worked with them, and he worked with another doctor. I'm not going to mention his name right now. And if he believed that they needed to be treated with this, he would send them to this doctor. So the doctor would administer the substance. And this stuff had a proven track record of shrinking the tumors. It was called tumor eggs. And patient after patient got better. I'm not saying it cured all of them, but many of them it did. Well, they brought their undercover people in, posing as you know, husband and wife, and, and uh, that they had a tumor, and, and uh, they, needed, they had cancer, and et cetera, et cetera. And... Uh, Right before they were gonna, the Dr. Whitaker was going to treat them, uh, with this, uh, substance for cancer, uh, she said, Oh, what a big needle, you know, and she goes on to make some other comments like this. And as soon as she said, Oh, what a big needle, 
The door was busted down. They came in with their uh, police thugs and arrested him. They, at the same time, they kicked Ken Anderson's door and arrested him, took him to court, and uh, Ken decided to fight this. And uh, there was a lot, believe me, that went on in this whole thing. But Mar uh, not only Martha was there, but I think I was there for most of the trial. We brought our good free, uh, uh, friend in Howard Freeman and other uh, um, individuals that had studied law and helped Ken. And he took his own law course uh, through some other uh, various agencies, studied this out, and had, had help. But they had at least 50 to 100 motions. I can't remember. There was a ton of them. They brought them into court. And I was there that day in court in uh, downtown Phoenix. And the judge hadn't even read them. You know what he did? They had a pile of, pile of motions like that. Fantastic motions with good legal arguments about this. He, re he picked them up one at a time. Dismissed. Dismissed with a smirk on us. Dismissed. Dismissed. Dismissed every one of them. They brought people in that had been treated with this tumorex that had gotten better from cancer, that looked healthy and vibrant. And they said, no, 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 no. Your witness is not admissible in this court. All that you can come here today is witness on this narrow little group of answers that you're allowed to say in a particular way, in a particular, in a particular way, and all this other stuff that you want to say about how you got better and how you feel better and is, is inadmissible in court because you're not doctors. You're self-diagnosing yourself. So you can't say anything positive about Ken Anderson, his character, his, the treatment, or any of that stuff. By the way, they weren't charging that much. It was shocking the amount that they were charging people. And you would have gone to the medical association just to get a diagnosis would have cost several thousand dollars. Then when you want to get into the treatment, you're talking upwards to uh, twenty to $100,000, depending on the type of cancer that you may have. Freedom? Liberty? What's wrong here? So we really, uh, I can't stress this enough, that our thinking has to be changed. Most people are living under a deception. They've bitten into that forbidden fruit. And they think that they're living in a free society. They think that what the medical association is, say, or our legal association, or our political association, or education, that's the best there is. America, yes! We live in the greatest country. Well, we may. I doubt that now. We're living off the residuals of what our Christian patriotic forefathers gave us still. And that's going fast. It's dwindling fast. And if you get four more years of Obama... Oh, I'm really going to step on some toes now. Even four more years of Romney, you won't re be able to hardly recognize America five years from now. Yep. Well, I got some amens on that. That's good. All right. Here's the thing. There is a destruction taking place, uh, a destruction, again, of our values. Now, where does that destruction take place? Right here in our carnal minds. They have a gift with that carnal mind. They read Genesis. They understand the power of the carnal mind. And they understand that if they can control that carnal mind... They can control us. And we give them power over us by giving in to their deception, by following these false gods, by following that snake mentality that was there in the Garden of Eden, by abiding in that deception. We have to understand 
that we have forbidden fruit all around us today. How do we know this? Because the scriptures tell us, Jesus told us, there's only one straight and narrow path. He said there are many roads, many ways, many paths of destruction. Well, would Jesus lie to us? No, he would not, obviously. So if he's telling us the truth, maybe we better really believe that. Maybe we better really follow that and take it to heart in a very serious way. There's many roads of destruction about us today. Many paths of destruction. But there's only one straight, correct, narrow path. And that's through him. You see, it's quite simple. They want, especially Christians, to be wrong. Because if we catch on to the fact that we have power by going the right way, believing the right things, trusting in Jesus Christ, not giving our carnal minds over to the power of the enemy, not believing their lies, and understanding that when they're opening their mouths, they're lying to us. Think about it. When they open their mouths, they're lying to us. Listen to me. They most likely will start out telling you something nice and truthful and positive. But their ultimate goal is deception and will lead you to deception. That's the hook. They'll take a truth and then mix it with a lie. And then they've got you hooked. Listen. If you take um, if you take a glass of water and you pour mud into it, or you take a glass of milk and you pour chocolate syrup into it, you've changed it chemically, have you not? They're changing us. That's their goal, is to change us. But the good news is, Jesus Christ, whom I love, Jesus Christ, whom is our Lord and Savior, who died on the cross for us, loves us, and he gave us the truth. He gave us the truth. What do you... If, if, if uh, I come, if a person comes and they see a problem, massive problems, massive deception, and they say, I've got only one, I, I, there's one way I can help you. I don't know if you can take it. I don't know if you can handle it. I don't know if you can accept it. But I can give you the truth. It's up to you. You want to believe it or not. But I come to give you the truth. And that's what Jesus did. He's that light. Oh, hallelujah for that light. Um, I do want to turn to the scriptures here. And we're going to read these verses in closing. Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. Ephesians 4, verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles. And why would Jesus say that? Or why would the scriptures tell us that? Walk not as other Gentiles walk. How are they walking? I love this. In the vanity of their mind. They're walking in the vanity of their mind. Uh, what does that word mean? Futility. It's futile. It's a waste. The truth is given us right here. Just right there, one simple verse. But there are many verses on this. Many. 
I'm going to give you more as we go on these messages. Having the understanding darkened. Well, isn't that what they want to do? Just like this professor said, they want to darken our understanding. Being alienated from the life. Who's the life? The life of God, the tree of life, Jesus Christ, through the ignorance that is in them. God put that ignorance in us. I know it's hard for us to understand, maybe to accept that. Will God do that? Yes, he did for a reason. Uh, the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Now, obviously, there's something about this blindness. There's something about this ignorance that we have to fully experience and learn. But you look at, you look at this situation here and you think, wow. We're really in darkness. We're really deep in the darkness. There's no way of escape. Yes, there is. There is a way of escape. That's the good news. And that is by putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. Putting on the mind of Christ. By entering into Him. In Christ, the scriptures say, we are to live and move and have our being. Think about it. In Christ, we're to live we're to move and have our being. Do you think you would stand out differently if you lived that type of a way? I venture to say most of us will hardly be able to recognize you. Even in this room today, hardly. You would be profoundly different, but you would be profoundly appealing in a good way. And you would be a profound danger to the forces of darkness. Because you, you would be a sponge and you would be a transmitter of the truth. Truth that would be setting people free. I would say in every way. Health-wise, educational-wise, religious-wise, uh, in the economic way. And God's raising up people, if you will notice, in all these various fields today in lots of different ways. There are ministries of freedom that are coming forth. There is a change, a profound change that's coming forth that I can see. That's the good news. We're on the right, we're on the winning way, folks. With Christ, we're in the winning way. And we need to stay in the way, the truth and the life. I have to close. Let's all stand. We'll close in prayer. Lord Jesus, we love you, and we just, just pray your blessing upon these messages of the mystery of the covenant. That's really the essence of what this is all about. Our Puritan forefathers, though they weren't perfect, were on the right path. We need to get on the right path. Christians need to get on the right path. They need to stay focused on that, quote, narrow way the way, the truth, and the life, and be set free. And abundance will be opened up to us. And we're going to see lives change in a miraculous way. Lord Jesus, move upon us, and may your kingdom grow within us. And as we become and learn to become your kingdom people, we love you, Jesus. And we uh, just acknowledge you as our true king and savior. Amen.